hi, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Helen Anthem. I work in the livelihoods and governance team at Fauna and Flora International. And I'm delighted to be joined by um, Meredith Gore from Michigan State University, Moses Mathoki from um, Old Pejeta Conservancy in Kenya, and Francis Massey from uh, the University of Sheffield. And my colleague, Rebecca Jury will be facilitating some activity and discussion in a little while. So um, I'm just going to do a brief presentation, or I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, and then Meredith, and then Francis, and then Moses will uh, talk a bit as well. Um, so this session came about... Um, because I was just casually Googling about gender and IWT, and I found just one article at that time, that was last year. And since then, I've found a bit more information, and I've spoken to um, other people who are actually interested in this issue and doing research on this issue. Um, so whilst there are probably more people doing research on gender in relation to IWT than I'd first anticipated. Um, the consensus is that most approaches to addressing IWT appear to be gender blind. Um, in other words, there's no distinction made between the sexes um, or the differences are acknowledged but not adequately analysed and acted upon. Um, so the title of this session, The Missing Link. That came about um, because a few years ago I was involved in a project which was trying to integrate gender into community conservancies in northern Kenya. And during one of the discussions with board members of one of the community conservancies, male board members, they said that um, women, they acknowledged that women are largely excluded from decision making within their conservancy but that they're not the only excluded group, that Moran warriors are also excluded. And then they noted that um, warriors, Moran are kind of free with their mothers. They talk about sensitive issues in front of their mothers, like poaching, security, encroachment. So they said, oh, women could potentially be the missing link in the prevention aspect of conservation in our conservancy. So that's where the title came from. Um, but it's important to note that gender is not just about women, it's about men and women, um, the relations between them, it's about who has power, access and control, it's about social norms, what's deemed to be acceptable behaviour um, and roles for men and women. And these shape um, the interactions between men and women and how they relate to wildlife and natural resources. And it's also important to note that gender intersects with other aspects or other factors of social diversity. So not all women are homogenous, not all men are homogenous. There's issues of um, ethnicity, class, wealth, all sorts of issues. And um, gender is ever-changing and it's not static and it's specific to context. Um, so, international conservation has its roots in big game hunting, um, or a lot of the international conservation NGOs do anyway, um, including FFI. Um, and at that time in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, hunting was a common pastime and it was a symbol of um, manliness. Um, so in her review of integrated conservation and development projects, um, Fiona Flinton writes that women, both colonised and colonial, were dominated throughout the period by men, especially white men, and it was those men that made the laws and the rules so conservation policy at the time was led by man as hunter turned conservationist. And it's also um, important to note that under colonial rule, hunting by local men and women became poaching. Um, so hunting was the reserve of the um, 
colonizers. Um, and I should note that throughout this presentation, the focus is on hunting just because I found um, that's where there has been most analysis of gender in terms of um, IWC. So I do recognize that hunting of wild game is not the only form of IWT. Um, so it's acknowledged that IWT is complex, a network of actors um, in the harvest trade and consumption aspects of IWT, and they all have different perceptions, different <coughs> attitudes, different motivations. Um, but still, there seems to have been little attention paid to gender despite an increasing emphasis on working with communities. Um, this summer, Rebecca and I co-supervised a student from the University of Cambridge, and some of the contents of this um, presentation came from her research. She interviewed about 30 individuals who are mainly pra practitioners, some researchers, some donors, but all who are um, interested in or working on IWT. Okay, so um, I'll move on quickly. Hunting, as I've said in the past, was viewed as a man's profession, and um, today, still to some extent, maybe it is. It's a way to express prowess and masculinity. So, for example, in northern Kenya um, and in other pastoralist uh, communities in Kenya, there's this um, pressure to go out and hunt, to catch a lion if you're a Maasai of a male of a certain age group. Um, but women do hunt, and women have always hunted. Um, so this mixed up. So this quote um, shows that in 1590 in Angola, women were hunting. Um, and this quote uh, from one of the respondents shows that women, even if they're not hunting directly, they have a role in hunting. So as um, informants, or they can encourage, contribute to hunting by encouraging men, cooking them meals or expressing a preference for men who hunt as potential partners. Um, and this again links to masculinity. They show affection to those who hunt because they're more male, masculine, and they ridicule those who don't. But um, there is a difference in the roles that um, men and women take in hunting. So these are generalizations necessarily, but um, women's hunting tends to be more subsistence hunting or um, bycatch, or as I said, they can be informants, whereas men's role is more, they're more involved in commercial hunting. They tend to target higher value species. Um, yeah, and um, where, oh, sorry, it's on the next point. Trade and trafficking is also differentiated along gender lines. Um, so the student found that women tend to focus more on the local level and the mid-level trade and transportation. Um, men tend to be logisticians and um, aggregate products and the kind of large-scale brokers. And I was interested to read that um, women are processors and they smoke meat, for example, whereas if it's um, about live animals and fresh meat, it will be men that do that. And um, one of the factors in that might be that it's men who have the resources, the capital to, um, to do that because it requires modern forms of transport and network and other equipment which women are less likely to have access to. So these are uh, some of the quotes from uh, the study. Um, women do actually also uh, 
traffic and trade in high value products as well. So you, you can't make generalizations, gender pans out differently in different contexts. You have to study that con context. Um, and I found that this um, second quote interesting from a study of um, wild game in DRC, that during colonial rule, men were engaged as uh, wage laborers. So it was women who went back to their villages and that enabled them to have an insight into these trades and the links with the villages. They could source game from the villages and take it back to the cities. So um, there's also consumption, of course, and perhaps or, in the little reading I have done, this seems to be the area of IWT that's perhaps where gender has been studied the most. Um, so in terms of um, the consumption of certain products being linked to cultural perceptions of masculinity, <coughs> sexual prowess, social prestige among men, it signifies wealth and class. Um, Ornamental fashion products are marketed to women because of their femininity. And then, uh, you know, beliefs that consumption of certain products transfers the traits to humans. So, um, fierceness of tigers and stamina of rhinos um, are targeted at men, whereas docility of deer is more targeted at women. So, um, there are obviously some challenges in trying to integrate or address gender in IWT. So these two responses were um, from uh, two different respondents that the student interviewed. Um, I thought the second one in particular is interesting because the person was saying it's irrelevant, tell me how gender is is relevant in all of this. And then that same person went on to talk about how elephant poaching is a really macho man thing to do. So that respondent was obviously observing gender issues at play, but was perhaps interpreting gender as being just about women. Um, and so hadn't taken that analysis further. Um, perhaps donors present a challenge. One of the respondents said that um, Donors tend to just ask for sex disaggregated data, but not more beyond that. Um, I've noticed in donor guidelines, the emphasis tends to be on gender equality, which of course I think is very important. But to um, appeal to conservationists, I think they should perhaps switch that a bit and focus on how an understanding of gender dynamics can, and the participation of empowered women in conservation can lead to better conservation outcomes um, rather than appealing to the kind of, you know, the ethical argument that we should be promoting gender equality. Um, and then, of course, there's the lack of data. And I was interested in the lunch session. I had a quick look around all the, um, not all of them, a lot of the posters. And I noticed that very few of them differentiated between men and women when presenting results from uh, community data. It was like 93% of respondents in X community said. Um, so of course there are a lot of um, risks to not thinking about gender, sorry. Um, basically we're missing half the story, I think, and um, if we're only gathering information or seeing things from one perspective, we're going to have less effective interventions. Um, there's also issues about impacting women, so for example, it's been argued that a blanket ban on bushmeat hunting in Vietnam increased women's workloads because women were responsible for clearing the fields of pests 
and this ban meant that there were more pesty animals. Um, also, there's issues of food security in communities where um, bushmeat forms a large part of the diet. Um, evidence has shown that uh, women and ch ch uh, girl children within a household tend to have um, eat less food and lower quality food. So if you're affecting food security of the household as a whole, whole uh, women and girls are likely to be even more impacted. So opportunities. Um, in other sectors and in um, other areas of conservation, Research has shown that when gender is integrated, uh, there are positive outcomes for both biodiversity and uh, for well-being outcomes. Um, so there's a lot of research being carried out by Bina Agarwal in particular and others, um, showing that mixed groups of men and active women um, leads to stricter rulemaking and compliance, greater transparency and accountability, better conflict resolution, and increased patrolling and enforcement. Um, so obviously all those factors could be beneficial for IWT interventions. So basically, by not, or by, by not thinking about gender and not um, understanding the role of women and their motivations and perspectives and knowledge, we're just, well, we're missing vital sources <coughs> of information. Yes, so that was all I had to say, so I'll pass over to Meredith now. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I am really happy to be on this panel with such diverse um, experts and am really appreciative to Francis and Helen for the invitation to participate. So thank you very much. I, I would like to try to address, I think, maybe two versus three main questions. The first is kind of what's known about the roles, uh, about gendered roles in aiding or preventing IWT, and then also what are the implications of gender-blind approaches. Um, I want to start off by just acknowledging my perspective on all this. So I'm a professor at Michigan State University. The uh, majority of my research right now focuses on crimi conservation criminology, which integrates uh, criminology and crime science with conservation biology and also risk and decision science. And one of the things that, that I think is noteworthy about conservation crime is that it certainly involves the rule of law. So there is a criminalization of, of the problem set here, but there are also rules in use, kind of the, the social norms and, and other um, uncodified um, rules that are very much a topic for, for IWT. Gender is very relevant for the rules in use. There are gender interaction norms in all cultures and societies that really are worth thinking about, I think, in terms of, in terms of uh, IWT. So what I want to acknowledge first is that uh, as, a, as a researcher, I have the privilege of collaborating with a number of different conservation organizations and government agencies and, and local communities. And so I wanted to share some of my insights from, from that experience essentially as an outsider. And I want to acknowledge that to date, my research, you know, if, if it does take a gendered approach, has taken a gender binary approach. And I, I'm not aware of much literature uh, in the conservation space that doesn't, if, if gender is addressed, it's addressed in a gender binary way. And I think that that is uh, not the way I think that gender scholars would acknowledge uh, represents best practices today. That being said, I want to acknowledge um, some of what we know about the rules of, so again, here we would talk about men, men and women. Um, we know uh, from, from a number of different contexts, so say for example, uh, illegal logging, illegal rosewood logging in Madagascar, we know that men and women have completely different knowledge spaces about the trafficking routes, um, the source, the transit, and the destination of, of, of illegal logging. And so, uh, you know, I was collaborating with a, a local civil society group. We conducted a participatory risk mapping exercise where we asked local, gr different groups of people in different villages to map 
um, you know, using colored pencils and, and stickers, you know, where are the trees, where is it trafficked, what are the roots, where are the stockpiles, et cetera. And then we use GIS to kind of merge all these maps together. And um, when we ran this exercise with groups of women, we got completely different data sets. So, and this was because the majority, in this case, of the majority of the loggers were male, but women, there were three women in particular who had been hired by the loggers to bring them food. And so these individuals actually had the most up-to-date knowledge about what the routes were that these loggers were taking because it was their job. And so this gets to this point that you mentioned earlier, Helen, if we are not, uh, one of the implications of, of taking a gender-blind approach is that we essentially completely miss data and we get an incomplete picture. Um, in this instance, we were trying to create a heat map or a hotspot map, and if it wasn't for um, these unique sources of information, we would not know uh, at all that these, that these routes were, were occurring. We also know that men and women take different roles uh, in the source, transit, and, and destination spaces for uh, wildlife trafficking. So, um, I had the pleasure of speaking with, with Sarah in, in the previous session, talking a little bit about uh, urban bushmeat consumption in Republic of Congo and also Democratic Republic of Congo and Rachel Varado. You've also done some work in this space. And so it's interesting to think about looking at the supply chain for uh, bushmeat from rural into urban systems. And what we see here is that men and women play different roles. Um, there are men who are often uh, engaged in the poaching or the source side of things, and then there are women who are engaged in the trafficking side of things. And so the question is why? And one of the really interesting things that I think that Rachel has been exploring is whether or not there's kind of strategic deployment of these gender interaction norms as a way to kind of mitigate sanctions. And so if there are gender interaction norms in a particular conservation context, that's something that offenders could, can learn, and that can be a strategic advantage that they try to take in order to be more successful in, in the IWT space. Um, also want to recognize that, uh, you know, I was in South Africa last week talking to a number of different communities about uh, rhino poaching. And I think that when you start to talk, in, in my experience, talking to individuals about how to engage in crime prevention of rhino poaching and, and trafficking, one of the things that I saw very clearly was men and, wheel, men and women yielding very different uh, types of power over crime prevention. And so there was one community that shared with me, for example, that said, you know, we have, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a kind of, um, celebrity associated with some of this rhino poaching and there's a lot of <coughs> money that local some of our local boys in this case are getting and they're buying a lot of luxury items with it and then there's there's kind of this um, this peer pressure and there's this kind of imitation that's happening and we've tried everything we've tried you know education we've tried communication we've tried sanctioning and it wasn't until this poacher's mother got involved and started uh, essentially, you know, telling this particular poacher, you know, you're embarrassing the family, this is a form of crime, that is ultimately the form of power that was able to move this individual out of poaching and now he is a ranger and works in anti-poaching. And so I think that that's something to also think about. Um, I want to acknowledge that when we take gender-blind approaches, we do miss data, we get um, an incomplete picture of, of what's happening on the ground, and this then means that we fail to understand the conservation context. Um, and for those of us that are working to move evidence to action, this failure to understand what's happening on the ground is kind of, uh, well, it's, it's fundamental to our mission. So this means that we could then have erroneous analysis that we're then advancing onto decision makers. Um, so I think that's, that's important to be thinking about. The, the, the last thing I want to mention is when you do take, uh, we know from, from other studies, from other work, uh, these gender binary approaches that we tend to take when we look at men and women, particularly in the IWT space, tend to essentialize genders, gender roles. And so there's this overwhelming assumption that uh, women are uh, the more advanced caretakers and that men tend to be the more advanced um, you know, utilitarian users of wildlife. And I think that when we essentialize gender in that way, we also 
uh, potentially miss, uh, you know, getting a complete picture or like a focused picture of what's happening on the ground. And so um, in addition to not taking gender binary approaches in the future, I would also uh, just try to provoke thinking about you know, when it is and isn't appropriate to, to essentialize uh, caretakers and, and, and utilizers of wildlife. So that's all, that's all kind of I wanted to, to bring to the conversation and I hope, it, I hope it kind of adds to the conversation. Sure. Um, whoa, that is awesome. <laughs> I speak loud. Okay, um, I'm taking a little different approach. I'm thinking less about prevention and more about understanding illicit wildlife economies and the lived realities of them and living within them and in the security responses to them. And so thinking about the lived impacts on people, households, towns that are really mired in this poaching and illegal wildlife trafficking conflict. And just a bit of context, most of, all of my research actually, has been in the Mozambique and South African borderlands, um, similar to a lot of people here and probably a similar context to what Meredith was talking about um, a really sort of high intensity organized poaching economy, but also very high intensity security militarized crackdown. Um, and I've been doing research there since 2012. So I want to start by just kind of three observations that really stick out in my mind that I haven't done much with, but have just been staying with me for a few years now that really I'm, starting, I'm trying to grapple with this, about what it means in terms of thinking more about gender and these questions that we're having. So I really thank Helen for organizing this to kind of force us to really tackle it a bit more head on. So the first one, starting in 2012, when I arrived in this area of Massangir, which is one of the core areas of the rhino poaching economy, I went there to conduct interviews with young men who were migrant laborers to South Africa. I didn't do that research because there were no young men to interview because they were all working in South Africa. Why is that important? It's because every year I would go back three, four months um, for over five years. Every year there were more and more young men. To where you go now and even two years ago, the villages that were pretty much void of young men, and by young I mean between 16 to 40 um, for 10 months of the year, are now pretty much full. Um, the men, most men don't go to South Africa to migrate in the same ways anymore. A lot of them are staying home. And it's not just because of the rhino poaching economy, but that is definitely a big factor that we're finding out through our research, is that that economy is attractive. It's getting young men to stay there. Um, and part of it is because they say, we're risking our lives and minds anyways. So to risk our lives to go in the bush um, and the reward is much higher, we're gonna stay. So that's one kind of clear demographic change that is not 100% directly related to the development of these poaching economies, but that really highlights um, things we might not think about um, when we're focused on the prevention, the responses, but like, what do these economies mean once they develop? And this is a huge demographic shift that we're starting to research is what does it mean uh, in this area where for generations, 10 months of the year, most young men have not been there, and now they are. And not only are they there, but they're there with this particular uh, lifestyle that they're being involved in. The second one that kind of parallels this, which is kind of contradictory, is that while you have this increasing number of young men who are around, and we're not sure exactly what that means for sort of the socio-cultural and socio-economic dynamics, is that there's an increasing amount of widows um, to the point where you talk to local officials and one of the first things they want to talk about is the epidemic of widows. When you ask them about, tell me about the poaching economy and its impacts. Um, and this is because there's been hundreds of young men who have been killed in Mozambique and South Africa or arrested, um, leaving behind households and families, um, fatherless. And many, most men in the area have more than one wife so they're leaving behind multiple households. So that's again another sort of really stark sort of dynamic that we can start to think about along gendered lines. And the third one is thinking about the masculinities of anti-poaching and of the illicit hunting economy itself. So a bit more on each and how myself and some Mozambican colleagues are thinking through some of these issues and approaching them. The first so we think it's really important to understand the experiences of women. 
not in terms of um, women's knowledge about how things operate, but what is their experience of living in these situations, of experiencing uh, the poaching economy, both from the poaching and hunting side, but also the security and policing side. What does it mean for people living there, for households, um, and the changes they're experiencing? There's a need to understand the perspective and experiences of both men and women, but, and I think this is what this panel is about, there's been a lot less focus on what does it mean for someone who husband may have come back husband who was lost and has sort of lived through the boom and bust cycles of these really highly lucrative poaching economies. And part of this is also that coming in this specific context of a highly militarized security approach, is that what resonates really strongly is that when a reserve or a national park kills someone's son or husband, they create an enemy. Um, they create an enemy towards those efforts, and they also leave households much more vulnerable than they even were before, because in this area, women um, are in charge of subsistence agriculture, men are sort of the cash primary breadwinners, so you're leaving not only one household, but if there are multiple wives, multiple households, much more vulnerable than they were even previously. So what are these trickle effects of um, this highly securitized approach to anti-poaching. The second one is that, you know, focusing on women again, and what Meredith brought up, not a sort of a binary approach, but looking at the experiences of men and women together and how they, uh, how they come together. And I think you could probably talk to 10 households, get 10 different answers. And in some of my research, I've seen how, yes, the experiences of women in terms of holding that power is there, but women also have power, especially wives, in terms of using the tropes of masculinity as a pressure point to get uh, their husbands to go become involved in the poaching economy. Um, and that, again, is one thing to sort of, sort of nuance our understandings of those different power relations and how they work in really different ways and understanding those different pressure points. And that brings in those ideas of what it means in certain areas you know, to be the male head of household and sort of the, the pressures of what and the expectations you're supposed to sort of fulfill. The third, as I mentioned, the masculinities and anti-poaching. Um, I don't want to talk too much, so I'll just leave it in the sense that they're very highly militarized, masculinized masculine environments um, and that same pressure of what it means to be a man and operate in these regions also influences the role that anti-poaching can take on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm ha happy to provide examples afterwards, um, but that idea of masculinity is what it means to be a man is not just the poaching economy but also how it's responded to and the expectations of being a ranger. And again, talking about responses, one thing that we've also seen is that while we need to take women into account for addressing um, anti-poaching and wildlife economies, efforts, there's been a lot of efforts that specifically focus women and children and particularly and on purpose ignore young men with the rationale that we don't want to support or give any benefits to young men who are involved in the poaching economy. And that again sets up this binary of who's involved, who's not, um, and can be really counterproductive, especially if the people you're trying to talk to are feeling ignored and pushed aside, saying, we already think you're an enemy, so we don't want to work with you. Um, so again, thinking about those approaches as not gender binary, but bringing them together uh, and thinking of them of, yeah, as a whole and not, yeah, there's, I'll leave it at that for the community development interventions, but just to focus on the women and children has become really problematic in certain areas in terms of men essentially being, well, we might as well go hunt anyways then. All right. <clears throat> so um, I work for a conservancy, which is a protected area in Kenya, uh, and the approach for or against illegal wildlife trade uh, is twofold. 
uh, we have we have a militarized operation um, with an armed ranger team. Uh, we also have a, quite a vibrant uh, community development program. Uh, and uh, you know, looking at at how gender uh, you know relates to these issues, uh, perhaps is what I'm I'm going to put in this conversation, uh, providing an overview of that kind of operation as well as. Uh, uh, you know, just eliciting discussion around uh, w what the real context in terms of uh, uh, how gender relates to illegal wildlife trade. So, um, with law enforcement or, or, or the militariz uh, militarization uh, that we have on the conservancy, we, we are at very high risk uh, holding a very critical population of, of the rhino. Um, in terms of statistics, from 2012, uh, the conservancy lost has lost 10 uh, rhinos to date, uh, with uh, about 16 failed poaching uh, attempts over the same period. Um, and, you know, it, it's quite violent. It's quite a violent uh, situation. Poachers coming into the protected area, armed with guns. Uh, and among, among some of the failed um, uh, uh, threats or attempts uh, have, have been fatal. Um, but actually on the poachers, on, on the poachers side. Uh, in terms of the community development uh, engagement, we have, we have programs around agriculture, uh, you know, working with uh, local education sector, uh, providing support to uh, schools and educational institutions, uh, working with uh, women groups, uh, youth groups, uh, etc. Basically, you know, uh, the different uh, groups that we have on there. Uh, with the, pro uh, the protection teams that we have, um, it's quite interesting. We really don't have any women uh, within, the ranger, within the ranger team. Uh, across the entire uh, conservancy, which has about uh, 700 employees, uh, we have about 15% of these uh, total staff uh, being, being women. So you can really see the, uh, you know, how flipped. Uh, the, the, the statistics look. So, of the, the community development work that we do uh, is basically to support all the conservation work on there. Uh, and in the hope, uh, which you know, is difficult to prove, uh, that part of that work would directly uh, support uh, or would, be, uh, would support against you know, illegal, 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 or poaching. Um, so, in my experience, what I've seen is uh, both men and women are involved um, actively in, in poaching. Uh, I, I think what varies would be the role uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, these kind of shared roles. And men will, will, will tend to engage in the quite dangerous, uh, quite Liberous, uh, uh, you know, um, parts of the uh, or roles, uh, while women will provide, you know, the less dangerous, the, the opposite of that. Um, so, for example, there was an incident where uh, we had a poaching threat, uh, and a lady was uh, was a bit skeptical about the whole thing, uh, so called actually called me. Uh, to share this information. Um, and she was doing that because she felt that it was too dangerous. Um, one of the poachers involved was actually the boyfriend. Uh, and I think she was more concerned about losing him um, than perhaps maybe anything else, which could be the benefits uh, that might accrue out of uh, the, illegal, the illegal activity. Uh, at the national level, we've also had experience with a very strong uh, women involvement, um, perhaps maybe, you know, facilitating on logistics. Um, and, and I think uh, something I think Francis or Meredith said was, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the differentiation in terms of, of these roles between men and women could also, you know, be around providing strategic advantage um, so, for example, where, we, where I come from, women are less suspected 
uh, to commit crime. It could be everywhere, I don't know. Um, so it is so happens that uh, there is w this one case uh, involving people of a different nationality. Uh, so there was a cargo at the airport and it was confiscated. It was actually uh, ivory and rhino horns. Um, and because the security personnel there couldn't speak the language of these nationals, uh, so they were kind of looking around and trying to figure out how to go about it. Uh, and then within the proximity of where they were, then there was this lady who was also from, uh, you know, she, she's a national of these guys who are suspects. So, and she was actually used as, as a translator uh, for those conversations. Um, and the security guys there took her contact details. Um, and I think there was another incident a couple of months later and they called this lady. Uh, the, that time, I think it was the fourth time, and one of the security personnel there realized that wherever they called this lady, she was very quick to get to the airport. So, um, yeah, and questions were raised around that for it only to be figured that she was actually the mastermind behind the whole, uh, <laughs> the whole thing. Um, and, and it was very interesting because, you know, uh, the chain reaction of that was... <coughs> a lot of information unraveled by, by, by the security personnel around it and actually uh, ended up cracking what would have been uh, lost cases or things of that sort. So, um, yeah, so there is, there is this involvement. Um, at the local level, what we've seen is uh, more women uh, becoming more willing to provide uh, intelligence information and sharing information about uh, approaching threats. Um, and then there is also, there is also it, it, works, it works both ways, but what I mean here is that uh, like from the database we have about uh, people who share information with us, then you'd find that there is a bigger percentage of women who are actively involved than, uh, than, than men. So, um, and, and then still again, we, the way we engage with the communities is that we have a, we have a governance structure which, which brings together uh, community representatives who are democratically elected uh, from the com different community areas that we work with. Um, and and there, is a, there is a very big variation uh, between the number of women who are in those committees and the number of, of men. Actually, uh, there is just about 5% uh, women representation in that. And actually, part of that governance structure is to work with us to dealing with illegal wildlife trade. So, uh, yeah, thank Strategic 
essentialism and would you, because I'm actually working on a, a grant proposal <laughs> with a local organization, would you say that this is something that um, people should really just like, keep their hands off um, because you have, I mean, uh, because you do have a cultural understanding of, um, of who is the caretaker, um, you, you do have re some research that shows that in natural resources um, some money is used uh, in more sustainable ways and others not, and that is gendered. Um, what would your recommendation be um, for these programs? I think your question is fantastic and thank you for posing it. And I certainly don't have a, a clear answer. I can just share a couple of, of, of thoughts. The first is that um, it's really easy to homogenize any group. Um, and so I, I, all the kind of donor kind of points that you, you make make a lot of sense to me. Um, and I don't think that they're probably unique to your case study site. but. I guess my feeling is you can always ask women what they want. You can always ask men what they want. We have a lot of different social science tools and techniques out there to engage and ask questions. Um, you know, and, and I, think, I think sometimes I might say it's maybe more of an implementation gap. Um, and so, you know, for example, human elephant conflict in the Zambezi region of Namibia, there are these hot pepper fences, right? And then you make a hot pepper sauce out of the, right? So you create a, a chili pepper fence around your melons, it keeps the elephants away, and then you harvest the peppers and you make chili sauce, and then you sell it at a premium in Whole Foods and make a lot of money. So everybody thinks that this is like a win-win, right? Elephants, you know, you reduce HWC, there's the, the benefit from the really expensive hot sauce. Well, the, 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 the research that I, that, that I did in, in uh, 2009 showed that well, women didn't, women were the ones who were gonna be responsible for planting the peppers, maintaining the peppers, and they didn't want to do it. And so everybody thought that this was this, you know, the men thought this, the conservation, the conservancy thought that it was this great idea. And so it was, in some ways it wound up being almost like a top-down approach to trying to solve HEC. So what do you do? You ask the local women, what is it that you think about, like, here's this intervention opportunity. Um, and so the, the idea was is that at the end of the day there was a compromise that was able to be found. It simply, you simply have to ask. So I think that um, for your grant proposal, maybe just write in some social science work and, and you can you know, ask, ask uh, men and women. Um, and and um, I, I don't see that as being an insurmountable hurdle, but I, I certainly don't think we should stop thinking about the topic. My name is Sandesh Nupani uh, from Trivan University, Nepal. And in my country, uh, the illegal wildlife trade scenario, uh, it is uh, monitored by police personnel or security personnel. So the structure in police personnel or the security personnel, the organization is such that 10 men is to two women, only two women. And those two women too want to work where their husband is working, like they want the postings there. So can it be that uh, due to lack, as illegal wildlife trade is mostly hidden, and the ones that are talked about is due to the interventions that are made, uh, maybe the gender roles are not discussed because of the administrative structures that are prevalent in monitoring, right? Uh, if you could discuss about that. Sure. So I think, I mean, in, in my experience, you know, I, I do a lot of, I mean, I, I'm a social scientist, so I think a lot of the times the administrative structure certainly influences um, uh, social, social interactions. And so I think sometimes it's whether or not, I mean, you have, you have to understand local context and um, uh, let me rephrase that. In an ideal situation, you work hand in hand with a local collaborator and find out what the, what the gender interaction norms are for that particular community. Maybe it's completely inappropriate for a woman to be asking a man a question. Um, you know, I do work on some covert wildlife use. Um, so maybe that person wants to be in a private room to talk about this. Maybe it's inappropriate for somebody, even though I'm married with children, it's inappropriate for me to be. So, so I think, I think, um, what am I trying to say? There are, there's a whole wealth of knowledge out there 
um, in the social sciences, sociology, anthropology, um, political ecology, geography. Um, I, I, think, I think we can learn about, learn from those, those tools and ask questions in a way that is meaningful for the scientists, but then also culturally and socially acceptable. I don't know if you have other ideas about that or if I answered your question. Um, something I meant to mention, and it kind of, I think it's going to where you're thinking in terms of these like top-down approaches, especially enforcement approaches. And one thing that kind of looks at different scale, we're focusing a lot on like local communities, but in terms of conservation organizations themselves. So we take South African National Parks, for example, um, and this kind of very external, top-down imposed structure we're bringing in male generals, retired generals, very like militarized and military sort of apparatus to kind of work within that conservation organization. And one of the things that has come up a lot is, you know, how that marginalizes not only the voices and roles of, you know, community-based and socio-ecological approaches, but specifically comments from women working in those organizations that feel marginalized because you know, in some of their words, it's, you know, the men are in charge of this important thing, the anti-poaching. Um, and it's a very male-dominated space with guys who are soldiers and come from that background. And it's not an environment whereby women conservation practitioners, no matter what their role, feel comfortable in. And that's something that's also come out from a lot of time spent in interviews and research. So it's not just necessarily about that local community level, but within conservation organizations themselves in terms of those administrative structures. Can I add something to that? We could also think about those of us that are conducting science on IWT and our gender roles yeah. um, and sort of what it, what it means for um, a woman in science or a man in science or somebody who's not gender binary in science and the, the kind of social interactions that, that I could go on and on and on about my personal experiences. And when I hear that my graduate students are going into certain rooms to have a private conversation with somebody who might, you know, I get like kind of mama bear about it. But there's also a lot of really important uh, gendered issues for women in science and men in science and gender non-binary individuals in science that certainly relate to this conversation. Um, I am not an expert in that, but I would just like to acknowledge your, your point's very thought-provoking in that space, Francis. Yeah, I think 100%. I think we have time for one more question, and then we're going to have to wrap up, so that's fine. So here, we can see another hand. Yeah, thank you very much for covering a very important aspect, um, which has always been left behind. I must acknowledge that Uganda's laws are also silent a little bit on gender issues. Um, and yet, this is a very critical part as we realize that women interact with the, uh, the environment more often than men. Uh, my observation is on the social links at the grassroots level. We know that illegal wildlife trade cannot only be understood at the upper level without looking at the local agents. Uh, because the traders actually work with the local people to undertake the illegal activities. And we well know that uh, these women at the local level who live close at the national parks have actually befriended most of the rangers, quite interestingly, as their wives or concubines. Um, and in this case, they have a lot of information uh, which they supply to their relatives within the communities, which actually limits ranger-based uh, ranger uh, monitoring programs because they already report where the rangers are going to go that particular time. So it, it is very crucial to um, break that linkage at the local level by understanding these gender di dimensions and involve women at that level. I, I really agree with you that engaging women at local level is the best solution, because without that, you're likely to miss up the link. So what have you found out uh, in your assessments in line with that, the, the kind of social networks at the local protected area level, and how that is able to mitigate 
um, various illegal resource use aspects in that case. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's that, that's quite significant, and uh, as you say, there is a, there is a lot of information at that level. Uh, but then we all realize the kind of risks uh, that come with illegal wildlife trade, uh, both ways, whether it is aiding, whether it is uh, preventing. Um, so that actually, for me, becomes the biggest uh, impediment to. Uh, progress in dealing with it um, or dealing with illegal wildlife trade uh, because of the or because of that risk so people will shy off from sharing that information um, it puts their lives on the line um, and unless there, 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 there is a very deep kind of trusting relationship with the provider of the information uh, you're actually most likely going to uh, going to miss it so uh, in terms of the way uh, we deal with that is uh, try as much as is possible uh, to build the relationships with the people uh, that can uh, supply this information. In fact, to a great extent, they'll not even want to give you that information either on the phone or within their communities. They might actually uh, get to arrange a meeting uh, away from the area. 